university consisting of six scientists of different fields of food related studies is expected to advise the Food Safety and Quality Authority as well as map out strategies of ensuring food that are imported and made in the country are safe for human consumption. This is basically to ensure that the authority is firmly grounded on the science and carries out its tasks based on scientific facts and principles in, in accordance with the provisions and requirements of the Act. Uh, to this, assess, to, to, this assesses, to assess food safety risks and to request information and research directed at providing information for the assessment of food safety risks, to prepare the scientific opinions on matters of food and food safety, as well as to provide scientific support to the Director General and the Board of Directors. The establishment of this scientific committee shows government commitment to ensuring food safety in the country. The tax now lies in the hands of the committee, members with the support of the Food Safety and Quality Authority and their stakeholders. Rahibite, GRTS News. Scores of volunteers from the Jame Foundation for Peace Hospital recently descended on one of the President Jame's farms for a wedding exercise. Abdullah Baji has detail of that story in this report. Jame Foundation for Peace, a philanthropist organization set up by the President to help the needy, is not also left behind in answering President Jame's clarion call for governments to go back to the land for food self-sufficiency. Staff of the institution, joined by volunteers from Tubakuta and Talokoto villages of West Coast region, recently stormed one of President Scanilai farms for weeding exercise. Modlamin Manga, who heads the delegation team, went down memory lane on the significance of the exercise as proceeds from the farm goes to charitable gestures. Um, we normally do support a lot of projects in this country, especially when it comes to scholarships. Last year, I think we spent on scholarship. And this is all because of His Excellency the President who set this foundation and that's why a lot of people have benefited and he's the main contributor of um, funding to um, Jammu Foundation for Peace. So these people you're seeing here are from Medina Talokoto and Tubakuta. Musa the Imam of Tubakuta and Ablai Pane, Chief Driver Jammu Foundation for Peace, both express immense gratitude to Jammu Foundation for partnering with other youth volunteers in the drive towards complementing the efforts of the government for the well-being of Gambians. With lots of prominence given to the philanthropist organization by the president since its inception by reducing vulnerabilities, the mood here is that of unbridled expectation as staff of the institution anticipate a trip to his farm for another exercise. Abdullah Baji, GRTS. We'll be back with news from Beyond Our Borders after this short break. World leaders gather in New York for the UN General Assembly. The anticipation of possible talks between Hassan Rouhani and Barack Obama is beginning to pay off. As part of CNN's coverage of these events, Isa Sise and Richard Roth saw or some of the happenings, including the arrival of the Gambian leader, President Jame. Fine, but I think there's some anticipation this year because of the possibility of a handshake or an acknowledgement between the United States leader Barack Obama and uh, the new Iranian president, uh, which if it happens, it'll happen today here, and it may not be in sight of cameras. It may be. There are several possible opportunities. And also there's the ongoing Syria crisis, which provides for media covering this and for any diplomat. Uh, some urgency and of course there's a host of other issues that tend to never get solved in four days when you put 170 leaders in one building. You know, and the question about the handshake, everyone is buzzing about the anticipated it could happen handshake between the U.S. President Barack Obama and the Iranian President Rouhani. You know, if and when it happens, are, are the reporters all primed at the ready with their cameras to get that moment on camera? I think it's uh, unlikely that the reporters will be there, unless they get a tip-off, which we don't anticipate at this stage. I think you can focus on the annual uh, heads of state, heads of government luncheon, which yes. takes place, where we are told the Iranians are supposed to be there. Sometimes they boycotted in the past because alcohol is going to be served. 
Barack Obama left last year mm -hmm. without the lunch because he was campaigning. There could be, depending on how high profile Washington wants to make it, a actual handshake across a table at the lunch and it provides a neutral opportunity on a world setting but you know no i mean you don't know and you've got to put it in context i mean this is a big deal if this does happen i mean it would be the first time since 1979 that the presidents of these two countries had had a face-to-face -face. so it's a big deal we're all watching anxiously to see if it happens christy meantime the syrian civil war is stopping the agenda of the united nations meeting on the way in the u.s as nick Patton walls reports there seems to be a sense of urgency between John Kerry and Sergei Lavrov to reaching a compromise on the Syrian situation. Uh, more how urgent it need, is necessary to get an agreement, but it still has been constantly held up. We now have an additional roadblock, the body that was supposed to be uh, implementing serious disarmament of chemical weapons under the convention they've just joined. There's a gridlock there. Uh, the Americans want that body to decide in the future whether or not uh, Syria is in contravention of that convention, and the Russians want that decision to be made by the Security Council. All eyes really on this afternoon's meeting between John Kerry and his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov to see if they can bridge that difference and also if they can work out what text there could be of a UN resolution backing up what those two men had agreed in Geneva as well. I understand from two diplomatic sources here the text of that resolution is still going to make some sort of reference to the important part of the UN Charter known as Chapter 7 which potentially in the eyes of some international lawyers authorizes force if uh, such resolutions are not adhered to but they're going to have to water it down to keep the Russians happy and everyone believes that resolution would require a subsequent vote uh, in the event that Syria is in violation of the convention to decide what kind of measures would be used. A lot on the table between those two men on a day where, as you know, we have both Barack Obama and Hassan Rouhani speaking here. The Obama speech likely to address Syria, uh, ongoing negotiations with Iran and generally uh, the U.S. role in the Middle East, Christy. It is a remarkable day for him in many ways. As you said, two weeks ago, he considered this body to be paralyzed, the building to almost be inconsequential in the pursuit they had for some sort of punishment uh, for the Syrian use of chemical weapons. That almost seems an age ago now because Syria has joined the Chemical Weapons Convention, has, despite saying publicly it wasn't necessarily going to agree with American deadlines, it has actually, in fact, delivered a declaration of its chemical weapons within the deadline that America and Russia set in Geneva. So that process seems to be going on unilaterally in Damascus, while the diplomatic track, certainly between Moscow and Washington, is frozen here in many ways. But there's a larger picture for Barack Obama here. Many accuse him of his Middle Eastern policy being somewhat in disarray because of the seemingly groping way that the Syria policies emerged in the past two to three weeks from finding their way slowly as disagreements and a lack of uh, alliances appeared around the world. So I think many looking to this speech and to see what he can pull out of the hat here uh, in the UNGA to see if he can set the White House's record there back on track. A lot really also riding on whether or not he decides it's wise to meet the new Iranian president Hassan Rouhani. There's been no scheduled meeting, both sides really holding out it as a possibility, but the window is short because I think many think it may be unlikely he would uh, choose to take that meeting before the important meeting of the permanent five members of the Security Council plus Germany who are meeting with Iran to discuss Iran's nuclear program and neg negotiations about that. He'll want to see how that meeting goes before he tries to potentially meet with Rouhani himself. That kind of leaves Friday for that really. So a time schedule and a lot riding on a lot of key choices here, Christy. Silence, Nick Parting Walls there. Authorities in Kenya say they are closing in on the attackers who killed more than 60 people in a siege at a shopping mall in Nairobi. Silence, our demon brings us up to speed with what is happening in Kenya have been saying that they are in the final stages of fully clearing out the Westgate Mall that is just down the street to the right here. Throughout the course of the day, we've been hearing small explosions followed by bursts of gunfire. Presumably that is as the Kenyan forces are going through trying to systematically clear out this location. There had been previously potentially an unknown number of gunmen still inside. There have been great concerns that certain parts of the Westgate Mall might in fact even be booby-trapped. The Kenyan Defense Force is on their Twitter account saying that three of their soldiers died of injuries that they had sustained over the last few days. Meanwhile, 65 people do remain missing or unaccounted for. A lot of people out there, Christy, hoping for word of their loved ones. The entire nation 
hoping that this horror that they have been through is going to end very, very soon, Christy. Yes, yeah, 62 people killed, 65 people remain unaccounted for, and are for those